directly from uh, lunch on Somalia. So uh, a busy day here uh, covering this part of the world uh, at CSIS. Uh, welcome. My name is Richard Downey um, from the Africa program here. Um, delighted to have so many of you uh, with us today for this discussion, uh, Kenya's fight against terrorism uh, under the spotlight. Uh, well, we recently uh, marked a somber uh, anniversary with uh, uh, last month, with one year having passed since four Al-Shabaab gunmen went on the rampage in the Westgate uh, shopping mall in, in Nairobi, killing uh, almost 70 people. Uh, the attack starkly illustrated the terrorist threat uh, faced by Kenya from Al-Shabaab uh, and its local affiliates. Uh, and despite the recent death of uh, Shabab Amir Ahmad uh, Godane, no one's under illusions that this threat is substantially uh, diminished from where we stand right now. The Kenyan authorities, uh, with support from its allies, including, of course, the United States, uh, have been proactive in facing this grave threat. Uh, notably, Kenya sent its troops into Somalia uh, almost three years ago, and they remain there today. Uh, but their fight against terrorism has come under increasing Scrutiny. Uh, Westgate raised uh, many, many serious questions which uh, remain largely unaddressed about the ability of security agencies to cooperate with each other uh, in responding effect effectively to terrorism. Uh, and there's growing concern that innocent civilians are being caught in the crossfire of Kenya's fight against terrorism, specifically Somali Kenyans and Somali refugees. Uh, after all, the very groups whose cooperation could be most valuable to the authorities. Uh, but who instead are being treated uh, as enemies, or in many cases abused, rounded up, deported, uh, and in some instances allegedly killed. Uh, we're going to examine some of these uh, uh, issues this afternoon, taking into account the evolving security situation in Somalia, how it relates to Kenya, uh, its people, uh, and its Somali guests, uh, and uh, Somali Kenyan citizens as well, and also consider the implications of Kenya's counter-terrorism policies and actions for the United States, which has, after all, a very strong security relationship with Kenya uh, and supports some of the, uni uh, the units facing allegations of abuse, such as the Anti-Terrorism Police uh, Unit, or ATPU. So we have a, a really distinguished panel uh, of experts, uh, regional experts, and Somali and Kenya experts to, to speak with you today. Uh, we're going to hear first from Lauren Plot Blanchard, who's a specialist in African affairs with the Congressional Research Service, uh, and who uh, recently visited Kenya uh, as part of a congressional staff delegation to look at some of the questions we're discussing today. Uh, we're also going to hear from Mark Yarnell, uh, who's senior advocate with Refugees International, uh, was also uh, recently conducted uh, field work in uh, Kenya, uh, both in Dadaab, the, the world's largest refugee camp near the border with Somalia, and in Nairobi as well. Uh, and, and his work uh, uh, that's, that's emerged from that uh, is, has just come out in a report entitled Between a Rock and a Hard Place. Uh, and then finally, we're delighted to be joined by Ken Menkhaus from Davidson College, a uh, renowned Somalia expert. Um, it's come up for the day, so we're very appreciative uh, of that from North Carolina. Uh, and he'll shed some light on security, recent security developments in Somalia and put them into the Ken Kenyan context for us, including some insights that he's also uh, gained from recent fieldwork uh, in northern Kenya as well. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, start with Lauren and work uh, our way back up to me, and then we'll open for uh, questions and, uh, from all of you. Thank you. I drew the short straw and, <laughs> and have to start this off. Um, I want to thank CSIS and, and Richard Downey for um, convening this today. This is a really timely topic. Um, yesterday, over the weekend, um, many of you saw that Amazon forces in southern Somalia took um, Barawe, um, which was really sort of a key stronghold for al-Shabaab. Um, that, along with Ahmed Godane's death, um, it portends some very interesting things for al-Shabaab, but I think um, it is far too soon to say that al-Shabaab is on a decline. I think maybe we're looking at more, um, more of a shift. Uh, and that is very concerning for Kenya, uh, which is sort of increasingly on the front line of, of this uh, war. You know, terrorism is, is not a new phenomenon in Kenya. It dates back to the 80s. Uh, the Norfolk Hotel was bombed by Palestinian terrorists back in 1980. Um, obviously, you're all very familiar with the 1998 embassy bombings, the 2002 attack 
attacks uh, against an Israeli airliner and against a hotel in Mombasa. Um, but then a, a real sort of uptick in uh, terrorist activity in the last few years, uh, particularly in the aftermath of Kenya's uh, military incursion into Somalia in October of 2011. Um, and, and so what I want to talk, to do, talk today a bit about is the, uh, the notion of of this threat as a distinctly Kenyan phenomenon um, and how the Kenyans are going about responding to it. Um, I think there is, there is a dangerous tendency and a concern that al-Shabaab is portrayed as a Somali problem. Um, and uh, as uh, the uh, UN General Assembly discussions on foreign fighters have highlighted, um, this is not the case, the Kenyans um, Kenyans within al-Shabaab compose the sort of largest uh, population of foreign fighters in al-Shabaab, and by many accounts, that foreign fighter component of Kenyans may be growing. Um, the question is, you know, what is their ultimate aim? Um, and, and some would argue that that aim is to go back to Kenya and build the insurgency within Kenya. Um, so I think that's, that is uh, very concerning, obviously, for the Kenyans right now, and also concerning for Kenya's international partners partners. Um, the international community has, has a large presence in Kenya. Um, it is home to one of the UN uh, headquarters in the world. Obviously, we, many of us have our largest diplomatic presences there. There's a large uh, private sector community there. I mean, Kenya is the hub for uh, transport and finance for East Africa. Um, so there, is a, uh, there are a wealth of Western targets, but also a wealth of Kenyan targets. Um, and <clears throat> the counterterrorism cooperation relationship, relationship between the United States and Kenya, and the United or the United Kingdom and, and Kenya, sort of goes way back, um, definitely to 1998, and that uh, relationship has been a strong one. Um, it's gone through some hurdles, um, but I think now it is it is increasingly going through a very tense um, moment. Uh, some of the recent allegations that have been raised uh, by Human Rights Watch, by OSI, uh, by local groups like Muslims for Human Rights in Kenya about uh, abuses conducted in the context of counterterrorism operations. Um, other related events, uh, I think Mark is going to discuss in greater detail, Operation New Salama Watch, which is the roundup of Somali refugees in Nairobi, um, and this sort of increasing perception by Kenyans and particularly Somali Kenyans of collective punishment that um, all Somali Kenyans are sort of being lumped in with al-Shabaab um, and that more broadly uh, Muslim Kenyans are being um, targeted uh, in the context of these anti-terrorism operations. Um, so these are, these are concerning trends and concerning as the United States uh, tries to figure out how to deepen the, the counterterrorism relationship in the context of very serious threats. I think you've probably all seen that the United States Embassy, um, which is the largest U.S. diplomatic presence in, in Africa, um, has uh, had to sort of reevaluate its presence. Um, they've moved a number of uh, regional positions elsewhere. Um, they are restricting uh, TDY, temporary uh, deployments to Nairobi. Uh, they have suspended a number of regional conferences, and of course, Kenya was always a, an easy uh, destination for these, these events. It's easy to get to and um, has a lot of, a lot of venues. <clears throat> And the Peace Corps program closed earlier this year, or not closed, excuse me, suspended. Um, so that is, is sort of a, a clear sign of the worry that we have about, uh, about the threat. Um, we've seen what appeared to be an increasing uh, intent to target Western targets. Um, there was what appears to be an attempt to uh, attack uh, Jomo Kenyatta International Airport back in January. Um, there was the discovery of a very frightening and sophisticated, uh, well, um, well-hidden car bomb in March uh, in Mombasa that appeared uh, designed specifically to get past sort of the, the Western um, security mechanisms, car checks, bomb checks, um, and those are all signs that Al-Shabaab is intent on targeting either Western or at the very least high-profile Kenyan targets um, and, and indicates perhaps an uptick from their sort of lower level grenade and IED attacks that they've been perpetrating for the last few years around Kenya. Um, <clears throat> 
to, to speak briefly about the Kenyan response, obviously, the Kenyans have been very engaged in uh, counterterrorism, uh, border security, um, and, and sort of dating back to 2009, we're increasingly focused on how to um, deal with the problem in Somalia, shall we say, uh, training, uh, reportedly training militias dating back to 2009, um, and then obviously in, in 2011, moving in militarily uh, with Operation Linda and Chi and joining uh, AMISOM in 2012. Um, since then, the um, Al-Shabaab response uh, has, has gone up in terms of attacks inside Kenya, um, and obviously the Westgate attack in, in September of last year uh, was the deadliest attack since 1998. Um, and then we had very worryingly what appears to be Al-Shabaab's uh, attempt to manipulate local politics, politics with their Mpeketoni attacks near Lamu uh, earlier this year. Um, they have very uh, savvily sort of tried to play on local <clears throat> grievances, Muslim grievances um, related to uh, uh, Christian and Kikuyu presence on the coast um, to attract recruits for, for the Mpikitoni attack. Um, and you see in a lot of their propaganda, propaganda a very savvy um, effort to sort of coalesce the Muslim community against um, sort of this common vision of uh, Islam being under attack by the Kenyan government and by its Western allies. Uh, they have a um, very flashy uh, Swahili and English publication you can find online called Gaidi Mtani. Um, Ken may speak about, about this more. Um, if you get a chance to look at it, it gives you a very good idea of how they are appealing to the Kenyan public um, and I think there is, there is a significant question about whether or not the Kenyan government's response and its public relations strategy um, to dealing with these various allegations of abuses conducted in the context of counterterrorism operations really are, are balancing out what al-Shabaab is putting out. Um, so I would raise that as a concern. I'm going to try to um, stop my remarks here. Oh, I will speak a little bit about the U.S. response. Um, <coughs> Uh, again, as I said, the U.S. has a very uh, deep and strong relationship with Kenya in terms of counterterrorism cooperation, um, military assistance uh, through uh, Department of Defense Train and Equip Authorities is now over $100 million um, to support both Kenya's um, internal uh, border security capacities uh, as well as their uh, engagement in Amazon. And then you have between uh, 10 and $15 million annually that's generally been provided to support the capacity of Kenyan law enforcement authorities. Not all of that is for counterterrorism. Um, a significant portion of that recently has been focused on police oversight and reform. Um, but you do have several million dollars a year that's focused on building uh, the capacity of the Kenyan police to respond to, counter -terror to, to terrorist attacks, um, its critical incident response, it's building their um, forensic investigative capacity, it's building their bomb disposal capacity. Um, it, it really sort of a wide range of things that the United States is doing, um, border, airport, and, and seaport security, um, building intelligence capacity. So there are a lot of different avenues for cooperation. Um, some concern that some of these uh, types of engagements um, may become a bit stovepiped and, and, and that there is not enough sort of uh, lessons learned, um, sharing about how to, how to work with the Kenyans on this. And I think that's a bit of a concern in terms of some of the shortcomings that were raised in, in terms of the Kenyans' response to Westgate. Um, a lot of concern about the lack of command and control. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And a lot of concern about um, the military's role in responding to Westgate, that they were an unsuitable actor um, that wasn't really sort of uh, prepared for responding to a civilian incident of that nature. Um, a year later, it is not clear where we are in terms of a lot of the uh, recommendations that were made post-Westgate. Um, and in the aftermath of Mpeketoni, I think you've got some new concern about, concerns about intelligence warnings that were ignored, um, about the slow response um, to, to the attack, which went on for hours and hours and hours. Um, and, and then I think there are also concerns about 
uh, whether or not the Kenyan uh, response is, is too reactive um, and, and not enough forward-leaning in terms of addressing this notion of extremism as a domestic phenomenon and not something that is simply, uh, um, simply a Somali uh, or Somali-Kenyan phenomenon. So um, there's a lot of food for thought here, and, and maybe I'll leave the rest for my colleagues in Q&A. Great. No, thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Lauren. It's a, it's a real privilege to be on a, on a panel with, uh, with Lauren and Ken, and, and uh, thanks to CSIS for, for hosting and uh, Jennifer and, and Richard for putting this together. Um, as Richard said, I work for Refugees International. If you don't know, it's a, an independent research and advocacy organization focused on displacement issues. Um, and I've been going to, to Kenya for about three years now in this capacity to look at the situation for Somali refugees, um, both in the camps in the north and also in the cities, and then going into Somalia to look at uh, uh, internally displaced Somalis. Um, and so this last trip was in, was in July. Um, and I traveled actually with my colleague Alice Thomas in the second row. So if there's anything I say that you disagree with um, or that's incorrect, just talk to Alice. <laughs> Thanks, Alice. Um, so I mean, the, the impetus for the trip in July was really uh, to look at the, the impact um, of the latest crackdown by the, the Kenyan government against Somalis. Uh, at the end of March, there was an announcement that all urban refugees who'd been living in cities and had been registered there had to immediately move to camps. And then about a week later, there was the announcement of Operation uh, Uslama Watch, which ostensibly was a separate uh, counter-terror operation, but inevitably Somali refugees became, became quite caught up in it. Um, and then unfortunately I had the chance to be back in Kenya last week to do a bit of follow-up so I can, can comment a bit on the, the current situation. Um, I mean, the, the bottom line is that not only is a, um, an encampment policy an effort to round Somalis up and put them in camps not feasible or realistic in the current context, but the effort to enforce the policy has done quite a great deal of damage, of course, to refugees themselves, but it's also created challenges for the, the Kenyan government. Um, but certainly there are, there are steps we think that can be taken to, to improve the situation, to, to mitigate vulnerabilities and also protect, uh, protect asylum space. Um, just for a bit of context, I mean, there's been, you know, historically waves of crackdowns uh, and periods of calm um, in, in Kenya uh, with regard to Somali refugees for years. And, um, but I think what was so discouraging and, and tragic about the current situation is that of late, Kenya had actually been making pretty significant strides in accepting the rights of urban refugees and allowing refugees to register in urban areas and together with, with UNHCR had been extending rights for um, access to health care and education. I think it's, <clears throat> it's quite different, you know, meeting with, with folks who are living, who have come from Somalia and are living and trying to make a living in, in Eastleigh neighborhood of Nairobi uh, without the need for food delivery or, or shelter assistance um, and this sort of a level of, uh, of dignity that's a bit different than being in a camp. Um, and so it was pretty remarkable the, the advances that were, be, were being made for, for the rights of urban refugees. Um, and by 2012, there was, there was, you know, we know about the hundreds of thousands of people that are living in, uh, in Dadaab and in Kakuma in the north, but there was about 55,000 people who'd been registered uh, legally to live in, in Nairobi. Um, but then in December 2012, uh, the sort of beginning of this, this next crackdown, um, the government made an, an announcement that citing national security concerns, all refugees had moved to camps, registration would stop, any programs for refugees in urban areas had to end. Uh, but what was pretty remarkable is that a local um, Kenyan legal aid organization took the issue to court and they won. Uh, and what the judge stated, did just such a remarkable ruling, he said, a real connection must be established between the affected persons and the danger to national security posed and how the indiscriminate removal of all urban refugees would alleviate the insecurity and threats in those areas. The state has not demonstrated that the proliferation of refugees in urban areas is the main source of insecurity. And I think what was so remarkable about the ruling is that it was focused primarily on issues relating to Kenyan's constitution rather than kind of expanding it to international law. So after this ruling, things got back to normal. Um, the Kenyan government actually began restarting their registration program for refugees in, in urban areas. Um, but of course, as Lauren described, the, the security situation in Kenya uh, remained tense. There was the, the tragic Westgate attack, among other attacks. And, um, and on March 26, we had another announcement by the government in direct contradiction to the court ruling, 
which again said, okay, now we're serious, all refugees have to go to camps. Um, and then again, a few, weeks, a few days later, followed by Operation Islam Watch. Um, and this time, there was a group of Eastleigh businessmen who took the, the issue to court, but the same judge actually ruled an exact opposite verdict and upheld the government's encampment policy, and I'm happy to discuss the, the issues around the, the legal case uh, further. So, uh, ultimately, the government, in an effort to, to demonstrate that it was an enforce, enforcing this policy, did forcibly relocate <coughs> Uh, roughly around 3,000 refugees to camps. It was primarily Somalis, but there were also Congolese, uh, South Sudanese, Ethiopians, um, even uh, ethnic Somalis who were Kenyan citizens who were caught up in the roundups. Um, and their experiences were, were pretty horrific. Uh, we spoke to a number of people who described just her, you know, to, uh, weeks in detention cells where they didn't have access to toilets and people were just urinating and defecating on the floor and, and people had to sleep there. Um, there were lactating mothers who were rounded up and arrested and separated from their babies. Uh, sick people denied without medical care. We spoke to a woman whose, um, whose son's arm was broken when he was thrown into a police lorry. And it wasn't until a few weeks later when he was actually taken up to a camp that he could access the International Rescue Committee's um, hospital in Dadaab. So when we went in July, the goal was to kind of to get to, um, to Nairobi and then go up to the camps and talk to people who had been relocated and find out about their experiences and what their, um, their plans were going forward in terms of restarting their lives now in, in a camp. And what we found was about 90% of the people had already moved back to the city. Um, you know, that, that, I mean, they, they'd made a life for themselves in, in the city and the idea of, of sitting in a camp wasn't, wasn't an option. And, and um, you know, given how amenable, amenable uh, Kenyan police are to bribes, many people uh, bribed their way back, they used human smugglers. Um, and they said they really wanted to, they, they, it was worth the risk because they wanted to get back to their, just their jobs, selling, selling tea uh, in the streets of Eastleigh. Um, there were some men who needed access to specialized medical care. Parents wanted to get their kids back into school. And so despite the, the threat of, uh, the continuing threat of arrest and abuse, the opportunities to be in, in the city uh, to access these resources um, and to live a more dignified life were, were worth, the, worth the risk. Um, I think what's, I guess what's difficult is that the, the government is now sort of trying to, um, to its credit, to, to have exemptions for people who uh, do want to live in the city, and they even have a form that you can fill out um, and explain your reason for why it'd be better to live in the city than the camp, medical, education, security. But when we asked refugees if, um, if they'd be willing to, to fill this out, they said there's no way in hell because the, the, you know, they, they've already risked and, and illegally taken a trip back to Nairobi. Um, the idea of then presenting themselves to the government to officially become legal um, wasn't an option. So the bottom line is that rather than actually achieving an enf um, enforcement of the encampment policy, people are back in the city but are living further underground and just doing everything they can to avoid uh, encounters with the police. So certainly much has been documented about the abuse that happened during Operation Uslama Watch by Human Rights Watch and other groups. Uh, and certainly in the report we put out, we tried to, to document some first-hand accounts as well. Um, it was certainly discouraging at the time that there wasn't more public outcry from donor governments like the U.S., uh, from UNHCR, which has a mandate to protect refugees. Um, and a number of the refugees we spoke to said they felt sort of abandoned by HCR and the international community. Um, I guess just a word on the police abuses, there, there, you know, for full context, there's no question that not all police are malicious, not all police are abusers, and Kenya is dealing with very real and serious security threats that, that Lauren outlined, and those threats relate to, to U.S. national interests as well. Um, but when you had a combination of an encampment policy with a counter-terror operation, it just, it, it put the abuse on steroids and took it to another level, and that's what we're trying to, to document. And it was kind of a free-for-all, I mean, there's a lot of documentation of the, the different police units, the general services unit, administrative police, in this case we had the park police, I mean, everyone was involved in kind of getting into Eastleigh and um, and engaging in the operation, and, and, it, and I think that, you know, another issue too was that many of the refugees, refugees we spoke to said that it wasn't, it was hard for them to believe that, that counter-terror was the actual objective because for most of them they were just asked to pay a bribe to avoid arrest. We heard a story of these, these one group of guys who lived in an apartment, and basically every night the police would come and ask for a bribe uh, in order for them to avoid arrest. The police came five nights in a row, and by the, by the fifth night they didn't have any money left, so they basically got some night bags together and were ready to be taken off to the Kasarani camp 
Um, so, you know, the message for them was if you wanted to avoid arrest, pay the bribe. If not, you're going to, you're going to prison. It didn't have anything to do with, with al-Shabaab. Um, and then I guess just one, one final note on um, the reaction to the abuses. Um, I mean, there's, there's been a, a good deal of pushback uh, from officials within the Kenyan government on how the, uh, how the abuse is reported and whether it is placed in the full context in relation to Kenya's security concerns. And I think there's some concerns on the part of Kenya that um, by promoting um, um, inappropriate behavior by Kenyan security services, it contributes to a, a, a narrative that, um, that those who are trying to delegitimize de de the Kenyan state can kind of grab onto. And I guess we would just say that, that our, our objective is the opposite, um, that by, um, by reporting on the abuses, it's an effort to, force, to push for positive change, not only to improve the lives of refugees, but to improve the relations between police and the refugee community, which I'm not a security expert, but I would hope that this would be helpful in Kenya's effort to target and ac apprehend actual terrorists rather than targeting the entire Somali refugee community. Um, now, just, just to, to finish up, um, I think it's important to understand a little bit about what's, what's happening on the, the Somali side of the border, because in addition to trying to push folks into camps, the Kenyan government is, is quite eager for, for Somalis to return home. Um, just one quote from Kenya's cabinet secretary for the interior in July, he said that, uh, quote, ensuring that the refugees are in their designated camps is the beginning. The next move is to close the camps and I reiterate that the refugee camps have outlived their purpose. I don't think the camps are going to close anytime soon, but that's the, the, the mentality that's there right now. Um, certainly, there's been some positive steps in the security front with the, um, the retake of uh, Barway and, uh, and the interest of the U.S. soon to, to open up um, or have an ambassador appointed to Somalia. But just on a few of the humanitarian indicators, um, recently the Somali government declared drought in six regions of the country. Uh, food prices are soaring, one million Somalis face acute food insecurity, and the very military offensive that pushes out al-Shabaab also can serve to, to displace uh, civilians. And then additionally, inside Mogadishu, where many ID internally displaced people live, um, uh, many of those camps are controlled by warlords and gatekeepers who actually steal the aid for themselves. So it's quite a concerning situation on the Somali side of the border. And given that you know, we don't expect that there to be mass returns anytime soon, despite some hopefully positive things on the, um, on the, uh, the political front, uh, we were hopeful that there's steps that can be taken now to improve what's happening in the, in, inside Kenya. So just very briefly, briefly to conclude, um, one thing that was pretty important is there was a really remarkable report by Kenya's Independent Policing Oversight Authority, which was created by, the authority was created by parliament in, uh, in 2011, and they produced a very candid, um, detailed report of abuses that happened during Uslama Watch along with recommendations uh, to reform the police services. And I think that, that Kenya acting to, to implement those reforms would go quite a long way. Very basic things like um, holding refresher courses on human rights, uh, improving relations between police and the communities they serve, um, and even just improving the hygienic conditions inside the, the detention cells. And I think, you know, security sector partners like the U.S. Could, could also be helpful in offering technical support to implement those recommendations. Um, on the part of UN Refugee Agency, which again has a mandate to, to protect refugees, I think it's not a secret that there was, a, I guess, a tactical decision to remain um, relatively quiet during the period of, of abuse in order to try to maintain good working relationship with the, the Kenyan government. But I think given the level, given the extent of the abuses and given the fact that not only were people brought to camps in quite a horrific way, but also several hundred Somalis were deported uh, back to Mogadishu. I think re-examining that strategy um, in the event of a future crackdown would, would be worthwhile. And then also UNHCR itself, it, it has an urban refugee policy, but it only has one senior international staff who's actually um, dedicated to working on urban refugee issues. And so, you know, ma matching resources with, um, with the policy would go a long way as well. And then very finally, there's some really strong Kenyan civil society organizations that have been around for decades that provide legal support and do advocacy for, um, for refugee rights. And so I think continued donor support uh, would be extremely valuable because it, you know, as important as it is to have three white people up here talking about uh, issues in Kenya, I think the, the role of, um, of Kenyan organizations like Katu Sharia and Refugee Consortium of Kenya, just to name a couple, 
um, having that voice as they lobby with the Kenyan government and provide legal support uh, is pretty remarkable. So um, I hope they're able to sustain their work. So I'll stop there. Uh, thanks very much and look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Mark. Ken, over to you. Thank you. I've been asked to speak uh, for a few minutes about the current status of al-Shabaab in Somalia uh, and then the implications of that status of al-Shabaab uh, for, for Kenya. And at the outset, I think uh, I'll say what we all know uh, about uh, our knowledge of al-Shabaab, and that is there are some things we know uh, and there are some things that we think we know. Uh, there's a lot we don't know. This is not a transparent organization. Um, uh, issues related to the change in leadership and what it means for the organization, uh, very, very difficult to say. So I'll try uh, not, to, not to step beyond the bounds of my limited competence uh, on this topic. Uh, if I could, I'd like to, to start by reflecting on what we thought we knew about al-Shabaab the day before Westgate. The day before Westgate, what we thought we knew about Shabaab was that it was in crisis. In fact, some of us were writing its obituary. Uh, it had been pushed out of Mogadishu. It had been pushed out of some of the most strategic areas of the lower Shabeli in Somalia. Uh, increasingly in the countryside. It had lost the very valuable port city of Kismayo to a combination of Kenyan forces and the Ras Kamboni militia. And then it had had, in addition, to, it, had, it had had a series of episodes of infighting that were already giving us clues uh, about some of the discord within the organization that culminated in the summer of 2012 in a bloody internal purge uh, in which many of the top uh, leaders uh, in Shabab were either killed or driven out of the organization. Most of the foreigners uh, who had joined Shabab fled as well, uh, felt unsafe uh, as a result of some of their own being targeted by Al Shabab. Uh, what was left of Al Shabab was uh, a rump organization presided over by hardliner Ahmed Godane. Uh, this looked like the beginning of the end of the organization. Some of us were comparing it to the Khmer Rouge. Uh, it wouldn't go away right away, radically violent leader uh, with a core set of supporters, but being pushed out into the countryside, increasingly irrelevant to the day-to-day -day, uh, life of Somalis. And at the same time, uh, in Mogadishu, where Shabab no longer had a large and robust presence, uh, there was an economic boom as uh, the diaspora and others uh, flocked in to invest, uh, People were staying out until late in the evening. There were uh, streetlights provided by the Norwegians, uh, and people were celebrating a return to normalcy, all of which appeared to be yet another damning indictment uh, of al-Shabaab, rejection from the Somali people themselves, which is, of course, critical in all this. And then came Westgate. And within 48 hours, the new zeitgeist was that we had uh, completely overestimated uh, al-Shabaab's weakness, that in fact it was a robust and dangerous organization uh, that was capable of this, this kind of sophisticated, bloody attack across borders. Uh, it followed uh, the Westgate attack with, a, with about six to eight months worth of additional attacks, some of which were foiled um, in Kenya, but which were quite frightening, uh, others of which succeeded inside Somalia itself, uh, attack on the Villa Somalia, the presidential compound, the parliament, uh, the judiciary, the airport entrance, uh, the UN compound. These were, these were very, very sobering attacks that shook the confidence of Somalis shook the confidence of the international community and raised the specter of an organization that actually had uh, what suddenly appeared to be quite robust capacity to launch uh, what came to be called complex terrorist attacks involving a suicide bomber in one vehicle followed by a second vehicle of gunmen who would rush in and wreak havoc on the intended target. They even reached into Djibouti um, and hit a restaurant, uh, and, and, uh, which resulted in the deaths of, of several uh, European um, uh, European Union forces, who were they exactly working for? I can't remember, at any rate, um, uh, across borders into Djibouti uh, as well. So the, the, the new narrative was that Shabab was incredibly strong uh, across the entire region and that we had gotten it wrong uh, before. Now, um, Shabab has had another set of setbacks 
Uh, its leader, Godane, was taken out in a drone attack not long ago. Um, it uh, has uh, lost uh, still more valuable real estate, uh, Bara the port of Barawa, the last seaport that it controlled in Somalia. Um, and so now we're getting yet another one of our famous mood swings uh, about Shabab, that it's on the run uh, and in a world of trouble. And what I guess I'd like to say um, is that we need to stop with the mood swings. Um, the fact is, this is an organization that I do believe is in decline. It peaked way back in 2008 in terms of its uh, legitimacy and support among Somalis and the territory that it controlled. Uh, it has been in a state of decline for a variety of reasons, mostly due to its internal uh, contradictions. Uh, but it is still and will remain for the foreseeable future a dangerous security threat to Somalia, to Kenya, and to the wider region of the Horn of Africa, uh, in part because it doesn't take that much to be a dangerous security threat. It doesn't, it's, it, what we have learned about Shabab is it only takes a relatively small number uh, of committed uh, jihadis to launch these kinds of attacks. And when you add to that the fact that its principal rivals in the region, with the notable exception of the Ethiopian state, um, but otherwise are quite weak and sometimes venal and corrupt and easily hit uh, in Somalia and Kenya, uh, that makes it all the more easy for Shabab to remain a major uh, terror threat. To give you a sense of how, we, how fast we can overreact uh, to, to Shabab's fortunes, uh, when it lost uh, Barawa this past weekend uh, in another city and is now pushed into the interior, uh, what uh, many commentators were saying is now it no longer has access to seaport revenues, and now it can no longer move uh, money, men, and materiel in and out of Somalia, so now it's trapped inside uh, Somalia. But that's unfortunately not true. Uh, the reality is uh, that Shabab will continue to be able to tax the goods that come through, not just Barawa, but every seaport in Somalia, uh, in the interior. It has done that very effectively for a long time. It's got quite a robust capacity. It would put the IRS to shame in terms of its ability to know what is being moved and who is being, uh, who's got a salary from where. Uh, they do tax it, uh, and they will continue to tax it whether or not they control the port of Barawa. Uh, likewise, even in Kismayo, when they were denied control of that seaport, uh, we now know that they were colluding with both the Ross Camboni militia and the Kenyan military in Kismayo to continue the profitable export of charcoal. So they were getting a cut without even having to do uh, much of the work. Uh, we also know that uh, Shabab will continue to be able to move money, men, and materiel in and out of seaports. You don't need to control a seaport to do that in Somalia. You don't need a committed jihadist uh, in, your, in, in your ranks to do that. Uh, anyone for a small and friendly fee uh, will move goods, no questions asked. And that's been the way the, the Somali seaports have been operating for a very, very long time. Uh, I had the opportunity to read, to be one of the first ones, uh, to read uh, some of the translated uh, uh, declassified documents from Al-Qaeda uh, related to the Horn of Africa that the Combating Terrorism Center at West Point subsequently published uh, and analyzed. And one of the I mean, thousands of pages of, of documents uh, back from the early 90s. And one of the, one of the fascinating ones was the East Africa Al-Qaeda cell uh, individuals who were moving back and forth between Kenya and the Somali coast in, in small boats and dows, um, complaining bitterly in their diary about these Bejuni captain, he's, he's immoral, and he smokes, and he drinks, and he womanizes, and he's a terrible, but he always knows the way really well. He gets us right where we want to go. Again, didn't take a fellow traveler, just anyone who's willing to take a fee to move your goods there. Uh, post Barawa, there are some issues, and post Godane's death, there are some interesting issues related to the future of Shabab that, that could affect Kenya. Uh, the big one, of course, is leadership. Uh, we don't know much about uh, the newly selected leader, uh, Abu uh, Ubaida. Uh, we know that he was the governor of Bay and Bacol region, which is the, the area that uh, Shabab continues to, uh, to hold most of the territory of. Um, he was not the uh, 
he is not a commander who had direct control over uh, operations, though. Uh, there are others who do. Uh, a gentleman nicknamed Karate has been the chief of operations for Shabab's uh, uh, secret network called Amniat that's responsible for most of the terrorist attacks, most of the assassinations, and most of the surveillance, which has a real chilling effect on Somalis who would love to do something about Shabab, uh, but are afraid uh, that they'll be knocked off if they are seen uh, as a potential enemy. It could be, uh, one of the things we're speculating about uh, is that with Godane's absence, uh, we could see the rise of more uh, moderate voices, one of our favorite words in Somalia, moderate. Um, that is to say, individuals who are more Islamo-nationalists uh, and less inclined to uh, pursue a global jihadi agenda, uh, individuals who might be willing, more importantly, uh, to negotiate a deal with the Somali federal government. Uh, that is certainly a dream among many Somalis. Uh, I don't know the exact percentage, but I would say, I would go so far as to say maybe even most Somalis at this point would prefer a negotiated settlement, some kind of a power sharing deal uh, to end this on the grounds that they won't be able uh, to defeat Shabab um, and that some of the Shabab, many of the Shabab uh, leaders are in fact uh, redeemable. And this gets back to the fact that in 2007, 2008, we have to remember that Shabab enjoyed enormous legitimacy in the eyes of most Somalis. They were, uh, they represented a, a, a just war, uh, a defensive jihad against the illegal occupation of Somali territory uh, by, uh, by, by Ethiopia. And it's been very difficult for a lot of Somalis to let go of that fact that there, many still have this residual, even though they're appalled uh, by much of what Shabab has done and said, uh, a residual sympathy toward the organization would prefer to see it brought into uh, discussions rather than left out in the cold and shot at. Uh, this uh, may or may not be the, you know, a, a majority view in Somalia, I don't know, uh, but I can tell you that there are some powerful external actors uh, who will oppose this. Uh, Ethiopia um, will be quite allergic to this. I think the U.S. government would be also uh, quite concerned about bringing al-Shabaab figures into uh, any kind of negotiations, whether they are negotiations just toward a ceasefire um, and, uh, 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 and, and an end of, of, of hostilities or even a power-sharing arrangement. Um, the fact is our patriot law uh, and related legislation uh, doesn't allow us uh, to decertify someone once they are linked to a designated terrorist group. And so uh, once a Shabab member, always a Shabab member uh, in our legal domain. And that's an issue for us, I think, if we're interested in trying to promote eventually some kind of defections um, and or uh, negotiated settlement, we've got to make sure they've got the legal space uh, within which to do that. Otherwise, if they step out and say, I'd like to talk, they, they feel like they run the risk simply of exposing themselves um, and then uh, being eliminated. Meanwhile, uh, we haven't seen many defections uh, from Shabab. We have seen, we've seen defections of individual fighters, lots of, of fighters, but that's not as significant as we'd like it to be. Uh, the fact is there's a lot of fighters who have been defecting and rejoining Shabab, like windshield wipers, uh, over the years. There's an enormous amount of movement back and forth between the Somali of uh, army and, uh, and, and Shabab. Um, and this is all driven by uh, pragmatism, who can offer me the best deal. Um, and this gets to a broader point, and that is that Shabab in Somalia today um, is not a movement that is defined by its ideological fervor and commitment. There are individuals at the top level who really do embrace radical jihadism, uh, but the vast majority of the fighters are just in it because they're getting a salary, um, or they're in it because they've been conscripted uh, in a village, uh, or they're in it because of the chance to loot. Um, and this we know from the defectors program, uh, there, there is a, there's a program where they're interviewed uh, in, in Mogadishu, and we've got a pretty good profile from the people who do that, uh, and they're quite convinced that this is not, uh, this is not a group of fighters who've uh, been brainwashed in any way. Where does Shabab continue to get its support? One of the key places that it gets its sh support uh, is not from radicalized youth, but it's from aggrieved clans. Clans who've gotten the short end of the stick in national politics, in Mogadishu politics, in politics in the rest of the country, they've been left out, they've been marginalized, 
and they're mad. In some cases, their land has been taken over by the more powerful clans that have been using the Somali federal government and its armed forces to appropriate land. Those grievances are deep. After 25 years of civil war in Somalia, there is no shortage of grievances, and they're deepening by the day. It is oxygen for Shabab. Shabab preys on the groups that are unhappy. Those groups opportunistically use Shabab, join them as a way of increasing their, uh, their, their, uh, their negotiating power with, uh, with others. But we've seen this time and time again. Right now, Shabab's core group of support in Somalia uh, consists of lots and lots of unhappy groups who have, in many cases, very legitimate, profoundly legitimate grievances, um, not least of which include the so-called Somali Bantu, minority groups that have been uh, oppressed and marginalized for years there. Well, that's one of the home bases for Shabab. One of the things I find fascinating about Shabab is that despite this position that it's taking, it has not, in any of its public rhetoric, adopted a Robin Hood narrative, that we represent the downtrodden and oppressed of Somalis against the public. Why not? Because they really would prefer to have the support of those powerful clans if they could, so they don't want to burn any bridges with them. But meanwhile, they'll take what they can get uh, from the weaker groups. And all that, of course, is part of the broader tragedy of Shabab, uh, and that, that is that the downtrodden and oppressed, the weak and the marginalized groups, are being used as cannon fodder by Shabab, just as they were cannon fodder and famine victims uh, in the past. Uh, they really have no friends, unfortunately, among the powerful in Somalia. Some will go so far as to argue, and I'm open to this argument, that Shabab's capacities today in Somalia, absent the kind of, of strong ideological uh, fervor among most of its, most of its group, uh, but its continued and very impressive capacity uh, to monitor where money is and to uh, extort taxes from everyone at every level, uh, that this is a group that could be moving toward uh, a glorified criminal racket in years to come. Um, and this is a very interesting scenario we need to be prepared for. I don't think they're there yet. I would not make that claim uh, yet, but I think it's an interesting proposition that as the group weakens, what we could see is uh, the Amniot in particular, which is this network, very effective network that, uh, that does collect money and collect information and engage in political threats and assassination, that could turn into a, a glorified mafia. Uh, and one that could insinuate itself very easily into uh, the existing government. What does all this mean for Kenya? Uh, one of the things that, Somali, that Shabab's growing problems in South Central Somalia almost certainly means is that the group has and will continue to expand both to the north in Puntland and potentially Somaliland and south in Kenya where its prospects are better. Uh, if the litany of grievances were strong in Somalia, they're even stronger in Kenya. Shabab has found very fertile ground among Somali Kenyans, among the coastal Muslim population, uh, among slum dwellers who aren't even Muslim, who are converted and radicalized. Uh, they have found no shortage uh, of sympathy, sympathizers, and in some cases, recruits there. The thing that is fascinating about the Somali Kenyans and Shabab uh, is that for one of the things we didn't necessarily to go back and just give you some context, the Somali civil war produced a huge wave of Somali refugees who passed through Kenya. Over a million Somalis <laughs> have, have passed through Kenya, most of whom are now living abroad, but many have stayed on. Uh, and while some are documented and have urban refugee papers, there are hundreds of thousands more who live there. In some cases, they get third country citizenship and then come back with their families and establish businesses. In short, Somalis, whether they are Kenyan Somalis or not, and they often purchase Kenyan citizenship, so that distinction becomes very problematic, um, they are stakeholders in Kenya in a big, big way. They have lots and lots, millions of dollars of business investments, real estate investments, families in schools there, you name it. Uh, and this, for a long time, was one of the explanations that we had for why Shabab hadn't hit Kenya that they were too afraid of blowback from their own community, that if they hit, if they launched a major terrorist attack in Kenya, they wouldn't have to worry about what the Kenyan security force did, they'd have to worry about what the, the Somalis did to them because they threatened the, the you know, this, this, this golden economic set, setup that the Somalis were enjoying in places like Eastleigh. Well, that didn't happen. Uh, the blowback uh, after Westgate did not occur. 
And part of the reason for that is the Somali sense of solidarity. It's very difficult to turn on your own uh, in, in that particular society. But part of it is also the fact that the Kenyan military and security sector reacted the way they did, with this heavy-handed collective responsibility, uh, 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 racial profiling, ethnic profiling, that was precisely what Shabab wanted. The Kenyan government played right into the hands of Shabab. Shabab loses when the fight is Somalis versus Somalis. Shabab wins when the fight are Somalis versus non-Somalis and Muslim Somalis versus Christians. That was the setup they wanted. That is why they attacked Westgate, and that is more or less what they've gotten. And many of their subsequent attacks, as Lauren has, 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 has suggested, uh, have been designed to further that, that set of clashes between non-Somali, non-Muslim Kenyans um, and the rest. Uh, a, a, a couple of final points on what all this means for Kenya. Uh, first, we need to be mindful that the, Somali, the El Shabaab wing or branch or affiliate of Shabaab in Kenya called Al Hijra uh, has distinct interests of its own uh, and has distinct command and control uh, of its own. Um, it may or may not continue along the same path as Shabab. It's conceivable that Shabab uh, could continue on a descent inside Somalia and even collapse at some point, uh, and Al Hijra would live on. Uh, it's bigger than the franchise, and at this point, it's got enough grievances, it's got enough local support that this could soon become uh, a franchise that could outlive the original, uh, the, the original group, Shabab itself. Um, a couple of a, a couple of other thoughts uh, that and, and that is that all of this is happening in a very unique context in Kenya, uh, and that is the the context of devolution um, and the context of oil exploration and extraction. Uh, the the Somali Kenyans have historically in the Northeast have historically been marginalized and lived under emergency rule until 1992. They've got loads of grievances, but. Uh, as Mark uh, was, was suggesting, they've also actually done quite well in recent years. Surprisingly, they have played the game of democratic politics in Kenya and won some of the top positions in past governments have been held by Somali Kenyans. They've also done really well in commerce uh, in Eastleigh and Mombasa and beyond. That It looked to most of us like the Somali Kenyans were major stakeholders in the game. And yes, Somali Kenyans are still among the poorest uh, in, in, in Kenya, but things were really looking up for them, uh, that they had every reason to embrace the Kenyan political system and embrace their citizenship. This past episode post Watergate, uh, w Westgate, sorry. <laughs> It was bound to happen without enough coffee. Um, this this post-Westgate uh, security crackdown has set that way back. And again, Shabab has exploited that. Shabab has also got the potential to exploit devolution. And this is where I, I, this is going to be very interesting to see. On the one hand, Somali Kenyans now have more power over their own fate than ever before. They're electing their own governors, their own legislatures. They've got their own budgets. Why would they want anyone to mess that up? This is fantastic for them. On the other hand, the way that political devolution has worked, played out so far in northern Kenya, uh, has been less than reassuring. Uh, it has been interpreted as zones, the counties have been interpreted as zones of exclusive ethnic claims on resources, creating winners and losers, uh, disputes over borders uh, that have gotten quite lethal. Northern Kenya is, in short, more violent now than it's been in years. Um, and there are more aggrieved parties than there were before. There are losers in this game as well as winners. Um, and then, on top of all of that, there's the oil, which is exponentially increasing the stakes over who rules in these counties and where clan borders are. Uh, it runs the risk if things go bad, and I think it could go well. Uh, there's lots of reasons to believe that, that northern Kenya need not suffer from a resource curse. But if it goes badly, Shabab is going to be jumping all over that. I'll stop there. Sorry, that was too long. No, it's all great stuff. And thanks to all of you. Fascinating uh, presentations and so many questions, I'm sure, from, uh, from the audience here. So I'm going to take uh, groups of uh, two or three at a time. Um, uh, microphones will come, so please identify yourself. And, uh, and uh, let's start with John, as you had your hand up first. Um, just up, up the front here. But micro yeah, micro microphone's coming. Yeah. Mostly for Lauren and, and Mark, but maybe also for Ken. 
Uh, as, you, as you both know, uh, the, the internally displaced Kenyans are not just Somalis, as you know, and they're not just Muslims. And impeccatoni land issues is not just impeccatoni, as you well know. And so my question is, for both of you, is to what extent has a Somali, that's all this, sort of, of sparked all the other deeper issues that go back to the whole history of Kenya, or has it overridden them so it kind of suppresses them even deeper? So it has it ignited long-standing issues in Kenya that don't have anything directly to do with Somalia, Somalis, or not? Thank you, um, and let's uh, go with David as well, uh, also at the front. Um, David through CSIS. Um, I'm told that Al Shabaab in Kenya is now a thoroughly Kenyan enterprise that uh, although some fighters are Somali, uh, the effective leadership of Al-Shabaab in Kenya is now indigenous Kenyans, and not necessarily coastal Kenyans, that there are a lot of Muslim converts from upcountry ethnic communities that historically have not been counted in, in the Muslim domain. And I'm told that the effective mastermind of the raid on Mpekitoni was, in fact, a Kikuyu uh, Islamic convert uh, against the local Kikuyu community. Um, so it seems to me that the problems the Kenyan government faces are actually a great deal worse than you have suggested, that, that I would say that the Somali issue is only one-fifth of the problem that the Kenyans face in terms of counter-terrorism, that they have uh, alienated Muslim youth in the towns at the coast, Mombasa, Malindi, and Lamu, that they have uh, disgruntled, largely Muslim, but not entirely Muslim, uh, communities I in the rural parts of the coast, particularly in Kwali district, where 30% of the land is now owned by um, Kamba. Uh, then you have the Somali issue. Uh, a fourth issue uh, is it playing a, a traditional Kenyan political game, which has been exacerbated by devolution, and that is ethnic conflict over land and water resources, which is now being manipulated by al-Shabaab for their own political advantage, playing off the game in Lamu and in Tana River and in Kwali and Khalifi and all these kind of places. But the fifth dimension is the upcountry dimension, that you now have lots of Kikuyu, lots of Kalenjin, lots of Abeluya, number of Luo, who are Muslim converts, who are now playing the institutional leadership role in Al-Shabaab. This is no longer a coastal problem. It's no longer a northern frontier problem. It's now a Kenyan-wide problem. So far, these sort of five clusters have not really merged. They are still separate entities which the Al-Shabaab High Command is working extremely hard to bring together into a perfect storm that would link all five. Um, and it doesn't seem to me that the Kenyan government is sufficiently proactive or realizing the full dimensions of the problem. And where it does recognize the dimensions of the problem, it is actually hamstrung by devolution that a number of the governors that belong to the opposition are actually exacerbating the crisis and making it very difficult for the police and security apparatus in Lamu to counter the terrorist threat effectively. So you know, what do the Kenyans do if this wider scenario, this emerging storm, uh, takes place. You know, uh, th this really does strike me as, as beyond their capacity. It's likely to overwhelm the Kenyan state. Uh, and, and simply to concentrate on, on the Somali issue is well taken, but I think profoundly underestimates the crisis which the Kenyan government is confronting. 
Okay, thank you. well, there's more, enough, uh, more than enough issues out of those uh, two questions uh, or comments to, uh, to, to uh, spark some response. David, as always, paints the apocalyptic <laughs> scenario. So, um, uh, Lauren, do you want to kick us off and, sure. and pick out any of those themes that, that you wish to, to talk about? Yeah, uh, thank you to both of you. Um, the good thing about answering David's questions is he generally has answered most of his questions. <laughs> so um, I, I, I think that is the worrying scenario that, that we have to be very concerned about. And, and what John has raised, you know, the, the, these, these issues are tied. Um, there are various, call them peripheral, call them marginalized communities in Kenya who have long-standing grievances that go back to the 60s, that go back to the 70s, that are more recent. Um, it, primarily, they, they are dealing with the government and these issues separately. Um, the Somalis, uh, the coastal communities, um, other, other groups. Um, and the concern is that Al-Shabaab paints a picture that pulls all these groups together. Um, the other concern that the Kenyan government has is that the opposition paints a picture that pulls all of these groups together. Um, you know, I think that the nightmare scenario for President Kenyatta is that Raila Odinga uh, is resurgent and, and pulls, uh, pulls an opposition coalition together that comprises his old allies in the coast, um, that draws on grievances in, in the Kalenjin community, um, and, and sort of pulls together an anti-Kikuyu uh, coalition um, using these grievances, long-standing grievances of land that everybody shares um, and, and that nobody has been able to get uh, the government to act on yet. Of course, you know, you've got um, a very promising uh, land reform process that could be set in motion by the new constitution, but it's slow rolling. Um, it's going to be uh, as challenging to address, if not more challenging, than the longstanding corruption problems that haven't been addressed in Kenya and uh, other accountability issues. Um, so I think there's a lot of cause for concern there. On the other hand, we do have this new constitution, and you do have democratic mechanisms by which these groups can address, theoretically, their problems politically. It's when they feel that that political system is broken and they can't get around it. Um, I, think, I think what's worrying is um, the government has tried in, in the context of Mpeketoni to somehow suggest or, or did initially suggest that this was maybe linked to the Mombasa Republican Council, which as some of you may know um, is a sort of a, a political uh, coalition. Uh, the Kenyan government would suggest it has um, insurgent aims um, and has uh, you know, links to militia hiding in the forest. Um, I, I think the, there's an interesting study that was recently done. I would encourage any of you who are interested to look at it, um, done by uh, Aneli Bota, who's a um, terrorism analyst with the Institute for Security Studies. She's done two parallel studies on radicalization in Kenya and in Somalia. And what's interesting is um, in doing interviews with Al-Shabaab members, both in Kenya and in Somalia, she finds two very different paths to radicalization, if you, if you would call it that. Um, and as Ken has suggested, um, the sort of path to Al-Shabaab membership in Somalia um, is driven by sort of a complex uh, set of factors of, around clan identity and um, economic motivations. Uh, and in Kenya, it's a very direct path through radical Islam. Uh, but what's very interesting was she found, you know, overwhelmingly that these 95 Al-Shabaab, self-identified Al-Shabaab members that she had interviewed um, were, were driven to Al-Shabaab because of their, their religious beliefs, that the final thing that pushed them over the edge for 65% of her respondents was the government's counterterrorism strategy. Um, and, and they sort of, in free form response, named a number of different actions. You know, some of them talked about the allegations of extrajudicial killings, the assassination of prominent imams. Um, some of them spoke of, of direct, uh, direct um, impact on their communities, you know, uh, roundups, uh, raids. Um, and and there, was, there was this overarching theme that the government was out to get the Muslim community in Kenya. Um, and I think that is, a, that is a worrying thing, whether or not that is, you know, whether or not the Kenyan government is responsible for all of these abuses. The perception is there, and the perception is fueling this 
push to radicalization, and it's something that the Kenyan government has got to address, and it's got to address with its beat cops and with its anti-terrorism police, um, with its GSU. Uh, this is this is the PR war that they are losing right now. Um, again, I would I would encourage any of you who are interested to look at uh, Guy Dimentani. The, uh, one of their first publications was put out right after the uh, killing of uh, Sheikh uh, Abud Rogo, and they did this very interesting letter in English. Um, you know, the Muslims in Kenya must understand that they are being deliberately targeted because of their religious identity and that helping their Muslim brothers uh, is a religious obligation. Um, calls upon the Muslims in Kenya to boycott the coming elections and not to be re repeatedly deluded by illusory promises of the government. Uh, not only is the participation of elections prohibited in Islam, but it is the current government that has terribly failed to protect the rights of Muslims in Kenya. This is the narrative that they are using to draw recruits. So I think it's very concerning um, if that becomes an attractive narrative beyond sort of the traditionally expected populations that the Kenyan government is looking at. Um, if they sort of increasingly are recruiting from among upcountry populations from Western Kenya. Um, these are not areas that the Kenyan intelligence community has focused, I think, a lot of, a lot of its efforts on and, um, and has a lot of inroads into. I'll just, just briefly, just to, to reference the uh, issue related to other uh, displaced populations um, in Kenya. I mean, certainly Kenya has been an extremely generous host to refugees for decades, not just from Somalia, but from Sudan, now South Sudan, Ethiopia, Congo. Um, I think the concern with the, and obviously they're all impacted by the, the policies towards the refugees and displaced people, but what came out in the, um, in the report of the Independent Police Oversight Authority was that the Uslam Watch was internally known within the government as op Operation Sanitization Eastly. Uh, and again, the perception that it's it's really targeted against um, uh, the Muslim population, Somali population, and and that it's an approach that um, uh, that serves to entrench divisions rather than, than bring people together. So that's been the main main concern. Um, we had a, a few more questions at the front. Let's uh, well, loads of hands up now. Um, uh, Dominic, you had your hand up, uh, and the gentleman at the front here as well. And Jennifer wanted to chip in. Thank you very much. Uh, Dominic Balthasar from the EU Institute for Security Studies. I have a question that goes to Ken. Um, Ken, you talked about uh, the mood swings of the international community with regards to judging the strength or weakness of Al-Shabaab. Uh, and you were, also, you were also talking about um, Al-Shabaab having enjoyed most local support in 2008, 2009, but that that is being in decline. Now, I was wondering whether you could shed some more light um, on how likely you deem uh, another mood swing to take place amongst Somalis with regards to Al-Shabaab, under what conditions you deem this likely, and what should be done to counter such a mood swing? Thanks. Uh, gentleman in, in the middle here. Yeah, um, my name is Kana Muchiri from uh, the Kenya Defense Forces, working at the embassy here in DC. Um, uh, let me first of all start by appreciating the way you have identified the problem uh, of the refugees, particularly in Kenya, and uh, also the crisis that there is. And uh, start by saying that Kenya government is really adhering to work with the international partners to solve those, to those, uh, some of those problems, especially the, the, the refugees. But at the same time, I would uh, be quick to say that the refugee crisis in Kenya is actually age old. It's a, a long, long time uh, uh, problem, which escalated with the fallout of the Somali government in 1991 and the 20 years of, uh, of a lack of government in Somali. And when this problem and the terrorism came into play, and the, is the, the posing the insecurity problem to Kenya from the common border with Somali, that is when the KDF actually went into Somali in pursuit of, a, in, in, in an effort to, to, to pacify that area and bring sanity in that country. In fact, the KDF incursion into Somali was mainly a national effort than a regional effort. 
when, it, when they went in uh, 2011. The surprising thing that happened during that time is that as much as they were going into Somali, most of the, the, the refugees' numbers from Somali increased into Kenya. So, as much as people may, see, may look at it like it was an incursion of the KDF into Somali, the, 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 the Somalis, the Somali Somalis were actually seeking refuge in the invading country. That is what I want to say. That is one. Now, the other thing that uh, I want to bring to fore is the, the, the issue of uh, the post-2013 uh, Westgate invasion. The screening of the nationals after that uh, in invasion did not in any way target one community. And the total numbers, which uh, we have the figures of those who are, who are screened, uh, the, the Somalis were about 1,000 out of 2,446. The Ethiopians, they were about 500. And another 500 of uh, Kenyans of various communities, all the others were actually from another 22 countries. So the, the broad spectrum of those who were screened we have the data, and the, the, the data was actually uh, revealed. Again, um, have coming from that screening effort, somebody, the, okay, Mark Kerner actually presented that the main problem was that this, those screened were being taken back to the camp. The age-old refugee status in Kenya and the problem in Kenya has always been handled by the UNHCR. The refugee camps are not run by Kenya, and the, the, the current president and the previous, pre, the immediate former president, Mwai Kivaki, are on record as having called to, for UNHCR to come and assist in the problem of repatriating the refugees back to the country. We will not solve this problem of the refugees by uh, taking them to the cities by having the UNHCR taking these refugees to the cities. It is good and better for any international community or body to come up with a solution that is going to solve out this problem. And again, when we identify this problem of uh, uh, taking them back to the concentration camps or to the, to the camps which are run by the UNHCR, then we should be comparing with what is happening in the other neighboring countries. How are refugees in those countries being handled? That, that should be a lesson learned, and it should be taken into, into consideration that Kenya is willing and, and wanting to be assisted on the refugee crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I had two questions. One, I think, uh, follows on that point. And Mark, I'm glad you said uh, Kenya's been a generous host of refugees, because I, you know, I, I do think there has been a kind of a lack of acknowledgement of the massive. I mean, not not on this panel necessarily, but in general, of the massive burden and task that that Kenya has had in hosting Dadaab, which is something five times its capacity, maybe even more. Um, you know, a source of, of, of radicalization, it has, it, you know, there has been some radicalization that's taken place, environmental impacts and, and conflicts in, with, the, with the local communities as well over water, water use and so forth. Um, you know, this is not to, I mean, the, the plight of the Somalis in those communities is, is awful and, and the idea of then being deported back to Mogadishu, equally, equally awful. But I do wonder, Mark, um, if you can talk a little bit about what what has been, and to this point, kind of the regional role in, in helping with the re refugee crisis and the international role. If, if UNHCR is kind of overwhelmed in Dadaab as well, um, other countries are not that welcoming uh, of taking some of some Somalis into their communities uh, here or, or in Europe or elsewhere. I mean, there, there are many, but uh, there are many more in Kenya. So, I, so it is, you know, maybe talk a little bit about how the, the 
rest of the international community can help on that, on the refugee situation, not just the security situation. And then the second question is, is, in response to the report and these allegations of abuse, have there been investigations launched? Has there been any kind of sign of going after bad apples, which, uh, which is what, they're, what some of these incidents have been dismissed as? Okay, thanks very much uh, for those questions. So well, there the are specific questions there for Ken and, and Mark, so who wants to? Ken, do you want to kick us off? Okay. But if, I, if I could jump in on the refugee question too, with just a, a two-finger a, a two remark, and that is one of the things we haven't <coughs> mentioned yet, but that everyone knows, um, is that the vast majority of Somalis who've crossed a border into Kenya, Ethiopia, Yemen, Djibouti, uh, aren't interested in going back home anyway. The whole, this is a diaspora remittance-based economy. They're, they have powerful interests in getting abroad. Their families don't want them to come back. Once they've, once they've crossed into Kenya, they figure they're halfway there, wherever, and many of them end up stranded in Kenya for the rest of their lives. But, but this, is, this is part of the bigger problem in Somalia. It's, its chief export is its own people. Uh, and for those of you who don't follow the Somali economy, $1.5 billion a year goes back in remittances. That dwarfs any other source of income. So for families to get someone out is absolutely critical. We had a case of Somalis stuck in Libya during the Libyan uh, war. And uh, the British uh, Somali diaspora was able to arrange a plane for them. But the only place they could go is back to Somalia. Uh, and they said, forget it. We'll stay in Libya. We'll take our chances. You know, they were halfway there. Uh, will, could Somalis have another mood swing themselves on al-Shabaab? Al and, and I think yes and no. I don't think Shabaab will ever enjoy, again, the kind of legitimacy it had when it was fighting the Ethiopian occupation in 2007, 2008. Um, the Somalis know better now what the group stands for. Uh, but uh, Somalis, Somali clan leaders in particular are very pragmatic. Um, uh, they, they don't like to back a loser. Uh, they will back a winner, and so that could cut in both directions. If, some, if Shabab starts to look like it's uh, bleeding uh, and is a lost cause, we could see some very rapid defections from whole clans that have been providing them support. Conversely, if, uh, if Shabab starts to look stronger and stronger and is a, you know, looks like a winner, uh, we could see a whole bunch jumping back on board, not for ideological reasons, just for practical reasons. Some other reasons, if the, if the Somali federal government fails, uh, particularly if the Somali federal government fails in one task, and that is governing newly recovered space. Right now, Amisom and the Somali uh, uh, security sector are, are, are moving from town to town. They've taken every major urban town uh, for, from, from Shabab, but they're not governing it effectively. Uh, and in fact, it's often leaving people worse off than before. That's driving some of these local populations back into Shabab's arms, because the one thing they had with Shabab, at least, was security. The Somali security forces are preying on them and, and actually making things worse. If Somalis feel besieged uh, by the international community, again, if there were, you know, God forbid, but if there were more terrorist attacks and there were crackdowns on Somalis abroad in Kenya and other countries, uh, I could see Shabab uh, tapping that uh, in, in, in ways that would uh, get them more support. And, and, and I think the other, you know, reality is that the longer Amisom stays, uh, the greater the risk uh, that Shabab is going to be able to use that uh, the occupation uh, on the part of, of neighboring countries uh, to its advantage. Amazon needs to stay for now. It's, it's essential, uh, but it shouldn't stay a minute longer than it has to. Um, no, thanks very much for your, uh, your comments and also, um, Jennifer, for the, the, the question. And I mean, you can't underscore enough the, the important role that Kenya has played um, in the region and um, in hosting refugees from a whole whole host of countries, uh, and so there's an understanding that there's going to be a bit of wariness after several several decades. And I think one of the challenges in um, in trying to enforce a uh, an encampment policy is that the camps themselves we know are are quite insecure. Um, I have friends who have been been kidnapped from the camps and taken into taken into Somalia, and so I think a concern is that by expanding the numbers into a camp that is um, uh, under resourced and overcrowded. Um, and again, there's environmental impacts on the, the region. Um, it creates more challenges because when people are living in cities they're, they're, and are able to be self-reliant, there isn't a need for the kind of external aid that you need when you're in a camp. And I think that, that's part of the issue is that the, the number of crises that are being experienced, not just in Africa, when you're looking at South Sudan, Central African Republic, Mali, but obviously in the Middle East and other parts of the world, 
the, the, number, the amount of resources available to respond um, aren't matching the needs. And so it's true, while, while on the one hand, I think there's reason to, to look closely and, and, and to examine Kenya's um, uh, engagement with refugees, it has to be matched by, by external support to, to be able to, to lift some of the, the burden that, um, that Kenya is, uh, is sharing. Um, I think on the, the issue of, of how it's being dealt with regionally, um, certainly there's, there's also tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of refugees in, uh, in Ethiopia and other countries. Um, the, the traditional sort of durable solutions for refugees aren't always, isn't exactly leading to much optimism right now when you look at um, returning to Somalia, which again isn't, isn't a desired option for many, especially when the Except conditions the are, now. yeah. <laughs> Um, the resettlement numbers are quite low, and uh, and obviously um, local integration into Kenya. There's a, there's a, uh, animosity around that. Um, there is a, um, a UN Refugee uh, Commission high level um, panel and and an initiative uh, by the Refugee High Commissioner to to explore creative solutions, um, trying to trying to get uh, you know support coping mechanisms that the Somalis themselves are using. Um, as Ken was saying, there's the very mobile population, and a lot of people are finding it difficult to live in Nairobi, are now moving to Uganda, many are going to South Africa. Obviously, it creates challenges when you're looking at um, third country movement, but if there's ways to, to understand those, what Somalis are already doing to cope, and to try to, to support those, rather than to try to force these three durable solutions, which just aren't going anywhere at the moment. So, but no, thanks for your question. Um, and then I'll briefly address Jennifer's question oh, about investigations. Um, investigations. You know, I think um, the independent police oversight authorities um, report on, on uh, Usalama Watch was a very important first step. It's their first monitoring report. Um, and it is important because it has, uh, it's, it's legally binding. Uh, and the police are required to respond. My understanding is that they were supposed to um, pre pre present a report um, responding to the concerns uh, by mid-October. So we should sort of have a first sense of, of what the police response to the, um, the recommendations of IPOA's report are um, in the coming weeks. They are also coming out with a new report, if it hasn't already been released, that I've missed um, on the Mpekatoni uh, attacks and, and the uh, security force response. So I think that's going to be very interesting. And, um, and, and again, I don't want to uh, paint an entirely critical picture of the Kenyan government. I think that these advances um, are, are very important, and we wouldn't have seen them a few years ago. Um, but there is a capacity constraint among, um, among these new reform institutions, the, uh, the IPOA, the uh, internal affairs mechanism now within the police. Um, they are short-staffed. Um, they are, for the moment, you know, under-trained. Um, it's sort of representative of the broader problem um, in terms of lacking investigative skills. Um, and, and they are working to build those capacities, but that's going to take time. Um, it doesn't happen overnight. And so the ability to investigate uh, extrajudicial killing, sort of these high-profile incidents, um, that, that capacity may not be there. Um, in some cases, perhaps the political will, arguably, is not there. Um, so I think some of those incidents are going to take time, but it would be helpful to see some more public rhetoric um, addressing the concerns. Uh, ambassador Godek, our ambassador to Kenya, uh, gave a speech about two weeks ago um, urging, urging the Kenyan government to be self-critical about these uh, allegations of abuses um, and to investigate them. Um, and he encouraged them to, to take action, to promote accountability. And I think that's an important message uh, that both uh, the United States and the Brits are, are sending right now. But just, to, just to add on that, I mean, I was asking questions about this when I was in Kenya last week, and one, one challenge is that people who had initially gone forward to report abuses now are, are fearful about putting themselves out there, and there's concern about um, safety of witnesses and about backlash, and so I think just gathering evidence is going to be a, a challenge in the current context, especially when there's, there's concern about the, the viability of the institutions. So. Well, we are almost at time. I want to give our panelists a, a chance to say any final remarks that they might uh, have, and, and also maybe just to ask a, a final question. It, it follows on a little bit from what uh, Lauren was, was starting to, to talk about, and, and that's, you know, where is the, the, the U.S. policy angle on, on this? Where, where's the U.S. leverage, uh, it, uh, uh, and is it willing to use it, in fact, uh, in, in uh, its discussions with uh, the Kenyan government, uh, particularly on the issue of uh, not only the refugee 
uh, issue, but the linked issue of security sector reform is a perennial challenge uh, in Kenya. Um, so maybe if you, you know, as we're in a policy institution, finish with a few pithy uh, bullet point uh, uh, policy prescriptions, and then we can all wrap up and, and go home. Uh, so uh, uh, let's start with, uh, with Ken and then end with Lauren. I'll stay away from the U.S. policy question and just say that uh, this past year, I did a study of Al Shabaab's use of new media, looking at its messaging, um, and one of the conclusions that I came away with was that it didn't, in fact, have a whole lot of original messaging. What it had done, very, very successfully, is it had appropriated a set of grievance narratives that had already been in existence among Somalis, uh, both in Somalia and in Kenya, and just repackaged it in more radical Islamist garb. Uh, and it's a reminder of the fact that Shabab could be could, could, could be eroded, could be maybe even defeated, but the grievances that it has tapped will remain. And that if we don't address them, something else is gonna come up um, and, and exploit those grievances. Um, I just think it, the, the, the situation now is certainly more calm in terms of the, the level of, um, uh, of tension and, uh, um, and the, the kind of abuse that was happening back in April, May, and June. And, um, and so things have calmed down now, but I think that because things are calm, there should be an urgency now to try to figure out how to engage with the, the Somali community uh, in ways that are more difficult when it's a, a more tense situation. I think that it's, it's naive to think there won't be um, some kind of attack in the future, and, and so there's legitimate concerns about the kind of another crackdown against the refugee population. So I think, again, just having a, an urgency to, as, as things are calm now, um, on the part of UNHCR to be as engaged and connected and, um, uh, and involved in outreach with the Somali community. Um, and, uh, and again, on the part of the um, uh, Kenyan government, I think that, that closing registration is unfortunate because um, when you close, when, you know, registration not only allows viability and, and it sort of expands rights, but um, you know, there's, there's more comfort and awareness of the population that's in the cities and we know, you know who the people are that are registered. And by, by shutting that down, it pushes people underground and I think creates more uh, uncertainty about, about the population that we're engaged in. So um, I'll leave it there for your pithy U.S. policy yes. recommendations. The Congressional Research Service does not take uh, policy <laughs> positions. <laughs> um, I will say, in, the extent of the counterterrorism cooperation between the United States and Kenya is is very important in emphasizing both the level of the threat that the that the Kenyans and and the, the Western community, the international community, uh, the Kenyan um, community are facing. And it's also an expression of how good the cooperation has been between the United States and Kenya. Um, and I, and I want to emphasize this. The Kenyans have um, been a very good uh, and, and cooperative partner. Um, having said that, uh, what leverage do we have now, given that we give uh, over $100 million in, in military assistance for the, for the purposes of counterterrorism and an extensive amount of law enforcement capacity building and uh, intelligence sharing? Um, <laughs> Our leverage, quite frankly, is is somewhat limited. Um, we have an important diplomatic message that we can send, um, but we can't simply uh, cut the cooperation right now. There are, there are too many uh, U.S. interests at stake in the region, and again, the threat is too real. Um, I will say I think that there are some, some areas uh, for improvement, and I think that there are a lot of uh, improvements sort of in the works. Um, but very important is helping to build the Kenyans' capacity to investigate, prosecute, and convict terrorists. Um, you've, we've seen too many cases of, of uh, suspected terrorists going through the court system and being let go. Um, Rogo, uh, Makaburi had all been through the system. Now, whether or not they were guilty, the Kenyan courts uh, were not, not able to convict them. Um, and ultimately, somebody decided to take measures into their own hands. So I think that's concerning. And in terms of um, supporting the Kenyans' ability to do this um, legally and justly um, is, is very key. And building a credible case against these terrorists is very important. And obviously, the Kenyans don't want to let these guys go on bail and have them go back to Somalia or go back um, and, and uh, you know, then be involved in an attack months later. Um, so having said that, uh, sending, sending the diplomatic message um, uh, is, is important. Um, and uh, again, trying to identify 
who are the extremists in the region, um, you know, when and why uh, they're involved in attacks is something that I think we all need to work on together because it's, it's not a problem that's going away overnight. Well, look, I want to thank uh, all of our panelists. It's been a great discussion. I know there are more questions than we have time to, to get to, so I apologize for that. But um, please uh, join me in uh, thanking everyone for their participation. Thank you.